so my name is Szabolcs Schneid and uh, I'm from ARM and mostly work on glibc, maintaining the ARC support for there. And uh, roughly the last two years I was looking at optimizing various metal tools and together with Virko, Dijkstra and Kitty uh, about that work. Okay, is it better? So, um, I, I'm starting with the, the, the results. Uh, um, this is comparing glibc 2.26 uh, that was released about a year ago to glibc 2.28 with uh, some remaining uh, patches that's not yet in or wasn't yet in, in glibc 2.28. Um, um, on the x-axis, there are the various functions we we looked at, and uh, on on the y-axis is it's how many times faster it got, and these are micro benchmarks. Uh, my benchmarks is just roughly timing a million calls, and there are two ways I do it uh, without dependency, so timing a million independent calls, and a million calls where each call input depends on the result of the previous call, so it's measuring latency, uh, roughly. Um, and so from left to right, uh, I don't know how well you can read it. Um, so first, there are single precision functions. Most of that work went in in GFC 227, actually. Um, most of these numbers are um, fairly stable, which means um, it doesn't really depend on what input uh, you look at, because the most ma of these functions don't have that many branches. So it doesn't matter what uh, what kind of input traces exactly look at, you would get uh, similar measurement numbers. The exception is the trigonometric functions. So you can see the sine and sine cos. Uh, those kind of measurements, I actually have two versions. One is uh, sine f and one is L sine f, which is for large input sine f. So, um, those numbers are not that uh, reliable. They vary a bit, but um, um, you can see that the large sign f used to be really slow in glibc because the argument reduction was used to be slow. So these are the results. These are the work uh, we have done. Uh, there are many functions which got uh, more than 2x faster. Um, same graph, uh, now comparing uh, against GFC 228, which was released about a month ago. Um, and yeah, the single precision stuff went in, most of the single precision stuff on the left went in 228, so, was it 227? So, um, there is nothing left there. Uh, um, the single precision trigonometric functions just went in recently and the speed up from that is visible there that does that much smaller speed up than what you have seen in the previous slide and that's because uh, IBM uh, Raya Lakshmi uh, did also work on on this and uh, and uh, they essentially optimized the 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 argument reduction code so it's so most of the uh, performance improvement went in in 227 but then we realized we can improve even further and that's what you see and the single precision precision sine f and cosine f um, and what's left really is uh, double precision uh, exp log and pow and exp2 and log2 as well. Um, and uh, those are under review, exp, uh, 
adjustment in very recently, um, and Logan Pau is is uh, uh, expected to go in soon and will be available in uh, GFC 229. Um, yeah, so this graph shows uh, roughly uh, just one function, how it uh, progressed over time. Um, so 226 and 227, exp didn't change much, so it's, it didn't uh, the same code. Um, 228, uh, there are two new improvements, so there are two sets of graphs there. Um, um, one very significant improvement that you cannot really see on this, uh, this, this chart is, is that we removed the so-called slow path from exp. So before 2.28, exp in glibc used to be correctly rounded in nearest rounding mode. Um, and it means uh, in some cases it's very difficult to decide which way to round when the exact result is close to a halfway case between two floating point values. And it can be very computationally intensive to guarantee that you round the nearest one. And GLPC had a slow path for that, and we decided that, no, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this that, that decision. Uh, if you are halfway, then either way is fine. Um, and so that graph is in the 228 graph. The, the first two bars are showing the speed up from removing this slow path. And I'm saying that it's not representative, but actually happening because the main benefit of it is that when you actually hit the slow path, and my micro benchmark doesn't hit the slow path. So all you see is, okay, now we remove the check, so there is not a branch there. So now a, a, a slightly faster, but once you actually hit the slow path, then GLPC could be easily 10,000 10, 10, times slower than the normal normal execution. So instead of these numbers, you thousand times more or ten thousand times larger uh, latencies, uh, you can see. And, and, and that was real problem for some people who run into it, these, these special cases when, when they hit the slow path. Okay, so to, for 228, the, the other set of graph is that, that there was another improvement on exp that essentially speed up, but only in a particular range when you are kind of the input is less than one, roughly. Uh, that had had a new code for, for that uh, by Patrick from Oracle. Um, and uh, that gave significant, significant improvement. Uh, here I just changed my benchmark to only benchmark numbers from that range. And that you see that compared to the generic case, yeah, it's, that, that's a better code, so it's faster. Um, but now we have a, a branch there in 228. Okay, so the new code that just went in recently, and um, uh, that's what I call wrap. Um, that's my new exp code, uh, which doesn't have any special case for less than one or something like that. Um, um, so I call it wrap because it still uses the so-called error handling wrapper functions in glibc. So glibc uh, has, when you call mat functions, uh, some of them have error handling wrappers and there are internal implementation that implement the actual mat functions. But the error handling wrapper checks either the input or the output or both uh, and decides whether to set uh, or no or do other error handling. Uh, uh, further, um, and, um, and this wrapper has a significant overhead, and it's also not trivial to remove uh, in glibc for, for various reasons. Um, so I leave the wrapper in, in the, in the first patch set. Uh, so there are new code, but still a wrapper around it. And of course, I also have a have a, a further patch to remove these wrappers because the new code doesn't require the wrappers. The new code does error handling in line. Uh, 
all the error handling cases are actually turned out to be always special cases that you also have to special case no matter what. Uh, so error handling ha happens in a slow path, so it can be in line. You don't need to wrap the functions further uh, to slow things down. Um, uh, what else can we see? Okay, so there is this red line, oh, vertical red line. So that's how far I could go with optimizing glibc, but then I did further experiments of, okay, what what if I do certain things differently? So there's a no check variant right after the vertical line, where I removed any sort of checks uh, uh, from my code. Uh, this makes the code incorrect when you get close to overflow or underflow in case of exp, then it has completely wrong res results. But uh, it just, I want to see what what's the overhead of all the checks. And so this doesn't have any error handling and no checks. Um, it turns out that's very tiny. Uh, you, you can still get some speed up from throughput. So that's the lower bar is measuring the reciprocal throughput and the higher bar is the latency. Um, but the latency doesn't, the latency is not affected much by these checks. And compare that with the difference between the wrap and no wrap version just before the red line. Um, so it shows that the wrapper in glibc has a significant overhead. And if I do the inline error handling those checks, are, you, you can do it in a way that doesn't really have much overhead. Uh, that's what uh, this tries to show. And then I did further experiments to some people sometimes asked, OK, what if we have a lower precision math library? glibc implements things too correctly and too precisely. But if we have a lower precision stuff, then it's surely much faster. So I was trying to optimize exp with less precision. So of the first, there, the last two uh, bars there um, are for 53-bit uh, precision and 43 bits precision. And uh, so my implementation, if you remove the last operation, uh, doesn't do a rounding to double precision number you remove that, then it's roughly precise to 60 bits, so 2 to the minus 60 relative error, something like that. Um, um, and uh, the 53 bits variant is when I try to make it just precise to 53 bits, which is slightly above one ULP error. Uh, uh, so the question is how much speed up you can get that way and where you can get some speed up, uh, it won't get twice as fast. Uh, at least I couldn't get it to, to uh, uh, go faster than that. And then when I lower the precision requirements further, about uh, another uh, 10 bits, so about 43 bits, um, I can use a significantly different algorithm, and then I can uh, write something that uh, faster, but well, that, so there is some scope for low precision implementation that's faster, but uh, yeah, don't expect uh, um, huge gains there. Um, what else? Um, another thing that you m might notice here is as we as I improve the implementation, it turns out that the, the bars between the latency and throughput, so when there is dependency between the calls and no dependency between the calls, uh, get wider. And in the no wrap version, in the end, uh, the latency is more than twice as big than the, through, uh, than the throughput. Actually, that's how I, I normalized the, these numbers, that the best no wrap number is 100 and the other is now 219 latency, um, which means kind of that the, this particular hardware, which Cortex-A72, where I did these measurements, um, 
able to do roughly two exp in parallel if there is no dependency between these calls. Um, uh, yeah, which is um, okay. So this is just a size comparison. It's not terribly interesting, but it shows that the wrap version when I apply my patches on top of 228, then it removes a lot of stuff, mostly large tables from PAO. Um, uh, I won't go into details. Okay, so what the main things I want to just uh, uh, explain in this talk is, is ju uh, what are the key ideas that made it possible to do significant performance improvements. Uh, and so for single precision, the biggest improvement is that we use double precision arithmetics. It turns out modern CPUs implement single precision arithmetics and double precision arithmetics with the same speed, essentially, except for certain slow operation, like square root and division. But you don't want to use the slow operations anyway when you want to implement something really fast. Um, so Double precision has a lot more precision, so it's worth using double precision, and, and that can help a lot in the, during the implementation. Uh, of course, this approach is not applicable in any con every context. For example, in SIMD, you would, if, if you want to implement vector instructions, you, you don't want to move from single precision to double precision. That, uh, that, that trick doesn't work there. Another trick is ta using table-based methods. It helped a lot. Um, for some reason, some of the old FDLibem code was not using tables. Um, I can see some, some, some reasons for that, but I'm not sure uh, why. So, so it can be code size, can be because it's harder to verify. But in practice, actually, it, it can be very useful. Uh, essentially, what it does is you can reduce the range on which you, can, you do approximations. Uh, when you double the table size, you half this range where you want to some approximate something. And what that means is that when you evaluate a polynomial uh, to do this approximation, then you have a polynomial terms like x squared plus some coefficients times x cubed plus and so on, then the distance between these terms grows bigger in, in magnitude. So, so because x is now in a much smaller range, much tinier than whenever you multiply by x, it shifts the numbers down a lot more. That means this polynomial will converge much faster, or you can s say that, uh, so you get a more precise result, or, or you can use a smaller polynomial. So, and, and you just increase the table size, doesn't affect your performance much until you hit some limit where you are no longer in the cache or, or something like that. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and there are further tricks like um, if you can optimize the special case checks that, that ha matters a lot um, in the beginning of the f of math functions and, uh, and another trick is to reduce dependency. Uh, I will come back to that. So for what, what about double precision functions? So the reason why double precision functions can be speed up so much is one of them is that GLIPS tried to implement some of them with correct rounding, and the correct rounding tried to be very precise. Um, and we don't need that level of precision, and we can gain uh, from that. So that's one reason. Um, one reason why double precision was very different uh, when I tried to do the single precision work compared when I compare it to the single precision work is, is, is that in single precision I don't have to do detailed error analysis because I just roughly design my algorithm and then I can just test it, just test all possible inputs and see uh, uh, if I get the desired uh, uh, properties. But with double precision I don't, cannot test all possible inputs so I really have to do a correct error ana analysis not only that, uh, now I don't have, I cannot use this trick that with single precision implement the single precision functions with double precision arithmetics. So I have lots of extra precision. When I implement double precision functions, I use double precision arithmetics because 
uh, I don't have efficient quad precision arithmetics that's efficient enough to verse it. So, so now rounding errors matter a lot, uh, and uh, that's a significant difference compared to uh, uh, my single precision work. So somehow we need extra precision uh, and uh, and uh, some other differences. So this is just an example how a math function looks like, and uh, this is actually the X F single precision X code with a uh, bit changes to fit on a slide. Um, what you can see is that it uses double precision arithmetic, so double underscore t. It's just I like to use this double underscore t. You can think of it as it's just double. Um, for most targets, that's true. Um, and then the first thing we do is just special case. There are always some special cases in math functions, and it actually matters a lot uh, how we do this. Um, uh, then after special case handling uh, comes the so-called range reduction. I don't want to go into the algorithmic details how this particular function works, just show what what, what are the components of uh, math functions. So in this case, we want to reduce the input argument that is x into r. Uh, that's some kind of remain there in this case. And only approximate uh, a, a mathematical function on, 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 on a smaller interval. Uh, and as I said, I use table-based methods. So there is some table lookup and some final magic, and the final magic is, is using a polynomial to do the approximation. What you can see here is I said that if you double the table size, then you re reduce the range where you have to approximate. It's not visible here because that's in the polynomial coefficients in this case, and I don't show the polynomial coefficients. Uh, but uh, what, you, what, what happens is that if you increase the table size in this case, then every term in the polynomial becomes much smaller, so it's much quick, quicker to converge, so I can play with it, uh, that increase, you use a huge table and prove possibly I can use a smaller polynomial, polynomial and speed things up that way. So that's exp. You might wonder, okay, can we just use this for double precision? So this is all double precision arithmetics use the same algorithm for double precision, and the answer is no, there are a lot of problems with that, like the argument reduction, uh, like when I compute R, that's two big numbers that are inexact, and I subtract them, that's a cancellation. It introduces in the end roughly 1,000 ULP errors. Um, so you cannot, uh, with this algorithm, you, you cannot uh, implement a precise double precision uh, uh, exp. You need to do a lot of other trickery to get there. Okay, so I also said that one of the tricks to speed things up is to reduce dependency. Um, so I just have some examples here. Uh, the most important reduce dependency changes uh, is that um, how you evaluate polynomials. The standard way to evaluate polynomials is the top line there, the Horner's way, and that's in many sense optimal, it uses minimal number of instructions and, uh, and uh, doesn't introduce much rounding errors, but it's a chain of uh, operations. So all, every operation depends on the results of previous operations. And you can rewrite that in such a way that maybe you need a bit more floating point operations, but they can be evaluated in parallel. And that actually helps a lot. Um, so yeah. Um, so this is the problem here is that usually the compiler can do this kind of things for us that optimal scheduling things, but in floating point the compiler cannot do it because if I do this change, I slightly change the rounding errors. So it's it's not a it, it it's a it's something that I have to do manually. I cannot rely on the compiler doing it for me. And then there is a other example, but I skip through that. Okay, so there are various other tweaks I did that s still give some speed up, but not as big, like tweaking constants. That was one 
uh, I spent a lot of time playing with it. Uh, you can use sm simpler constants that end up being uh, immediate, let's say, in a, in a compare instruction, uh, and, and then you don't have to load it and then compare against the register, and, and so you get less number of instructions. Um, you can optimize how these constants that are loaded from memory, how you are accessing them. So GCC is not very clever by default about it, because it cannot really be. So if you just use a bunch of constants, that often GCC generates code that computes the address of each of those constants and then load them, and that's a lot of instructions. So instead of that, I put them in a struct, in an external translation unit, and then GCC only computes the address once, the base address of the struct, and uh, that's a bit better, at least on the R64. Um, um, yeah, and then, then there are various other uh, little trickery to optimize these cons and, and values that goes into tables. Uh, yeah, we also were careful about making sure that error handling doesn't introduce overheads. And in general, anything that's in the slow path, is you should want a single check that separates the less common case from the common case. And the less common case, uh, uh, you, you don't want to affect the handling of that. Uh, don't want to affect the, the common case. And so the common case can be really fast. And Making sure error handling is tail calls or call frame is, is, is one of that. Okay, so unfortunately, by optimizing it, I run into various cases where um, things vary. So it's so you cannot really write generic code that's clean, nice generic code and works for all targets and equally efficient on all targets. Um, so there are various cases where I had options to configure, okay, in this target do this, on this target do that. Um, one is the integer round and convert uh, problem where some targets, AR64 has instructions for it, or S390 also has instructions for it, but other targets don't have instructions for it, and then I have to do some magic. Um, uh, you can do rounding, uh, and conversion fairly easily, but that, that, that the, the efficient way to do it is doesn't really work uh, in non-nearest rounding mode. And now GLPC wants to support non-nearest rounding mode, so uh, somehow I have to fix it up. Uh, my choice there was that make the <laughs> sorry, I don't know what I what happened there. So m my approach there was to not affect too much the nearest rounding mode case. Is, is so, so GLIPC sometimes did change rounding mode to nearest rounding mode and the end restore nearest rounding mode. This is very intrusive because most people only care about nearest rounding mode and they are in nearest rounding mode. Uh, they don't want to change the rounding mode uh, uh, for that. Um, so my approach was that increase the polynomial precision enough that even though in non nearest rounding mode on some targets, I get results uh, that in the range reduction is, is in a wider range, I, I still get enough precision that the end result doesn't have too many ULP errors. So that was my approach. So there is no um, floating point environment rounding mode changes in, in the new implementations. Uh, but it means that in non-nearest rounding mode, some targets have different results. Because targets that have single instruction rounding mode, they always round nearest. Other targets that don't have nearest rounding, uh, that ne don't have integer instructions, conversion instructions, then they do these tricks that, that work differently based on rounding mode. Um, FMA was another case where if you have FMA, certain things can be done much faster and much simpler. Uh, compared to if you don't have FMA. And then if you have FMA, even then, if you compile with contract or multiply adds into an FMA instruction versus not contract 
that can uh, make differences. So there are various differences in cogeneration, and it's of course a bit painful when you want to test things. Okay, so this was so far the main tricks that I used uh, um, to speed things up, and and uh, in other functions that I haven't touched, there are still plenty of opportunity to 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 make improvements. Uh, uh, to, to, to try to apply these these techniques, which are not, uh, uh, yeah. Um, what I want to talk about now is that the difficult part of double precision is to deal with rounding errors. So, how do you get enough precision on double precision uh, uh, functions if you only have double precision arithmetics to use? So it's just this. I try to summarize in a table how. how double precision arithmetics works with respect to rounding errors. So how much rounding error is introduced by a double precision operation. Um, I express the error in terms of ULP, unit in the last place, which means if you have a real number X, then the ULP of X is, is there are two surrounding floating point values, neighboring values around X, and let's say the distance between those numbers, that's the ULP. Uh, that's the granularity of the floating point representation at that point. And, uh, and uh, for a single rounding, um, this means that uh, if you round the real value to a floating point number, you can at most get half a ULP error, because the worst case is when you are in the middle between two floating point values, and then you round to one of them and you get exactly half that distance of half uh, that much error. So the question is that uh, to do various, dis various operations, how much error you can get. Um, and of course, uh, during uh, uh, mathematical function evaluation, there are mm, values that are exact fl floating point values, but there are also values that are approximations. Uh, that means there are there is some ideal ideal uh, real value there, uh, but you're not computing with that, but you are computing with floating point numbers. So there is some rounding error already in the inputs, and uh, so that's what I try to summarize here: that the red numbers, red uh, symbols, mean uh, real numbers that have to be rounded first to a floating point number before you can do operation with it. And the black symbols mean uh, they are exact floating point numbers. And uh, the multiply, the first part of the table should be very easy to process. Um, uh, you get some smallish ULP errors if, if you do those operations. And the interesting part is the last two lines where, where you can end up with, uh, in, in one case when when you add two numbers, and they are very similar in, in, in magnitude, but opposite sign, uh, then what happens is that, let's say, the top 10 bits are the same, and you subtract two such numbers, uh, then the top 10 bits cancel out, so you lose precision bits there. Um, and if one of the numbers, at least one of the numbers, was inexact, uh, then the tail bits of this number got rounded away before this operation. So when you lose precision, uh, those tail bits would be relevant, but you rounded them away. So roughly speaking, if you have like 10 bits cancellation, you can introduce a 10 bits worth of error, that is a 1,000 ULP error uh, uh, with just one add. Um, so that's the the second to last uh, uh, line there. And the last line is the case where you have, you add two numbers and one is the big exact number and the other is a small inexact number. And that means, um, uh, let's say the, the smaller number is, a, is, a, is 10 bits smaller, that is a thousand times smaller. And it, in that case, you, if you align the two numbers because before you add them up, you, you can see that the, the tail bits of the inexact number is shifted down compared to the big number. So, so the, 
the rounding error in the inexact number is, is now uh, much less relevant compared to the final result. So if, if I express the error in terms of the ULP of the final result, you, I get close to half a ULP error. And what I want to show here is, is that when you do the approximation, at least one of the inputs will be inexact at the end. So when you do a computation, uh, there will be also the rounding errors. So let, if you think about the, what is the final operation in your math function, at least one of the inputs will be inexact. And so that means red in this slide. Um, and you want to get close to half ULP error. So I said that my implementation is of X plus roughly 60 bits. Uh, actually, all of the implementations of double precision uh, functions that I uh, submitted is, is like 0 0.6 ULP error, worst case. So the only operation with which you can get there is this last, last operation. So all the other operations that involves a red symbol is larger than 0 0.6 ULP. So you can know for sure that the last operation in every of one of my implementations uh, last operation that introduces a rounding error it must be this last type. So the question is, how do you get there? How, how, sometimes you want to do multiplications and other operations, so how, how do you end up that you only do that kind of operation? Uh, so I won't have much time to go over everything, but uh, very quickly, um, there are tricks to do sort of exact add that means if you add two numbers, you can actually recover the rounding error. So what you want to do is, is compute, uh, compute the difference of the exact value of the add and the rounded value of the add. And it turns out you can do that with this kind of trick and, and, and uh, you get the sort of the rounded value of the add and the tail bits. Uh, in two separate numbers, but uh, you can recover that bits and then use that further in the computation. I also added here, as mentioning that that this was the kind of check that was removed from glibc because once you have a very precise implementation, in the very end you can do this trick. You have a big exact value and a small inexact value. That that's your final operation, and then you can compare the tail bits that you get rounded away in that final operation. And that's the T, the tail bits. And the tail bits is less than half a ULP, has to be. Um, and depending on how precise it is, you can actually say if you are close to half a ULP, then you know, know you are a halfway case, and that's difficult, and you, don't, you are not sure if you computed everything correctly. But it's not close to half a ULP, it's much less than half a ULP. Then you can say that, oh, I'm pretty sure that uh, my, my rounded result is, is actually correctly rounded. Uh, and and the, this check is just saying, uh, it's if with the right C value, is that is the result close to a halfway case? And when we remove the correct rounding from glibc, is, was that removing these checks? Um, so what about multiplication? So again, what you want is you compute the multiplication that gives you a rounded value, but you want to compute the difference between the exact multiplication value and the rounded multiplication value. And it turns out you can just do that simply if you have an FMA, because FMA computes the, those bits uh, with a single uh, rounding. The question is, what happens if you don't have FMA? So it, this, even this, it seems, oh, you just have one extra in instruction, an FMA, and you get the tail bits, and now we have a lot more precision bits because we have the top bits and these tail bits. Uh, even this you want to avoid in general because further down the computation, now you have to compute with two numbers and it gets complicated, but at least you can get more precision bits this way. Um, when you don't have FMA instruction, then actually you have to do something like this. And uh, this is why you really need FMA if you want to do these very precise computations when you, when you need a little bit of extra precision 
compared to double precision arithmetics. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I won't explain in detail. What happens is you essentially split up the inputs into two parts, the top part and the bottom part. And when you, once you can split the inputs, then you can do the multiplications in a way that they don't, they, they, the result can be represented as a double precision number. And yeah, it's, it's additional 16 floating point operations. So it's completely not practical. You don't want to write any, uh, this kind of code anywhere. Um, instead, what you do in practice is try to do something where you get some extra precision. So not, you don't get all the tail bits, but you want a little bit of the some tail bits uh, on of the multiplication and I have something here that I actually use in the, the power implementation power function implementation but I skip this um, now um, yeah um, so the difficult part of double precision implementation is just identifying where I have where do I have this precision bottlenecks where, where I really need some extra precision and then using these tricks to to get that extra precision. Uh, it turns out in, in XP it's relatively easy. The 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 difficult part there is is that is a there is a final when I do the polynomial approximation I then have to multiply it by a fractional power of two. So that's that's the end of the function. Return fractional power of two times polynomial, which looks like one plus p. And if I write it this way, which was actually present in my earlier slide where I showed the single precision exp that had exactly that line, that gives two ULP errors. Um, so it's already too big uh, uh, for a good quality double precision implementation. Um, just break up the the. In, in this case, we can just break up that uh, parenthesis and, and, and we are lucky because the leading coefficient is one. And it turns out we have uh, some fractional power of two, which is a big number in this case, and then another fractional power of two times p, and the, the rest of the polynomial is small. How small? Again, if you double the table size, ho half the size. So as you increase the table size, you can decrease the size of, of p, and th these two numbers, the magnitude difference between these two numbers can get larger and larger, and that's how you get more and more precise uh, uh, implementation. So the table, table, lookup table is, is an important uh, part of getting a high, high precision implementation. Um, but in this case, it still says that as one ULP error. The reason is that the table lookup value itself is a double precision value that is uh, rounded value, so that's an inexact number. So we want a big exact number plus a small inexact number. And how I get there? Well, I have a table that has the top bits and the bottom bits, and the top bits is exact and some tail bits and that's inexact. So, so I need simply more precision bits in the lookup table. That's how I solve it. Um, yeah, and then there are two ways to do it, and if I do it in one way, then I have a problem that I have to adjust the exponents of these numbers. It's not just a lookup table, but I also have to adjust the exponent bits, which I don't show here, but uh, yeah, that makes uh, the decision between these two, uh, how I, uh, because the first one needs more computation than the second one. Uh, I skip this. Okay, I skip through the log. Okay, I just want to say about log that this is um, implementation of log in Pow in my Pow patch, and um, and I'm just saying that this uses the tricks that I showed for exact add and exact multiplication, and the way you do it is you, you end up with stuff numbers that are big. And that's what I, I, I marked with B. And numbers that are small, that's what I marked with S. And the numbers that are big is roughly 15 bits bigger than the small ones. It's like, let's say, 2 to the 15 times larger, at least, than the small ones. And, um, 
And when you add up the big numbers, you have to be careful. So the big numbers, if you look at, you look through the code, but I won't go over every line now. When I, when I add up the big numbers, they always carefully add it up with the exact add mechanism, just to recover the tail bits, the rounding error, not to lose any precision because of rounding. Um, and then I have the small numbers, and then when I add up the small numbers at the very end, I also add there the polynomial at the very end, the, the tail of the polynomial uh, at the very end. Um, actually, it doesn't really matter what order I add up the small numbers. So I have to be very careful how I add up the big numbers, but I don't have to be very careful how I add up the small numbers, because I introduce rounding error in the small numbers. They are 15 bits shifted down compared to the big numbers. So I have some rounding errors there. I don't really care that much. Um, yeah, um, so when I so the, it, this computation gives me a log that is roughly uh, have 15 bits extra precision compared to double precision, and that's what I need in PAO. Uh, I have I need a more precise log than, than than double precision to get a good quality result at the end. Um, and what I wanted to say here is is this, this is where I. Uh, some compiler support or language support uh, would help uh, math library implementers' life because I don't want to figure out what's the best scheduling or evaluation strategy for that polynomial is and the uh, last line for adding up all the small bits. And it matters a lot. So that, that was another place where I spent a lot of time tweaking things. If I add up in the wrong order, then it turns out that I introduce dependencies that are uh, so. So if I add that up in the right order, then some things can be evaluated in parallel. Some of these S numbers are completely independent and don't have to wait for each other and evaluate parallel in the hardware. However, the compiler cannot do this for me. I cannot tell the compiler that all oh, those last two lines there, you can evaluate every every of the, one of these operations with associative math, whatever or order you like. I don't care. I can't tell that compiler, so I manually optimized it to be optimal on the cores where I tested things, which may not be optimal for everybody, but yeah, that's what I did. Uh, yeah, uh, I have some further slides about my uh, things that I probably mentioned already. Um, and I think that's the end of the talk, so I have some further slides, but uh, I'd rather take some questions and whatever you want to discuss. I, I can uh, discuss my, uh, some, some further things, but yeah. If there are any questions or comments. In uh, large Fortran codes, we often uh, compile in a way that turns off the, or sets the, uh, the CPU in the mode that truncates the normal numbers to zero. Would that Im influence your implementation? So in the common code path, I think I don't have, I D don't have denormals in the common, I shouldn't. Uh, I, I'm very careful because it it's very easily introduces uh, underflow problems and I want to avoid that. So in the common code path, it's almost always never anything denormal. But in the error handling path, uh, you have to handle the, 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 that those cases, and that might so so in let's say in underflow cases you might might get completely wrong re results if you do that. Uh, in I think yeah uh, yes I think for for you, you can say that for usually for most inputs. Uh, it wouldn't be a problem, but actually that breaks the assumptions that the math library is making. So math library is, is assuming I to pre arithmetics, uh, but in practice it would work for most inputs. Hi, so I just wanted to ask in terms of uh, compiler wishes. Oh, sorry. Where are you? Can I continue? Yeah, I can hear, I just don't know. Okay, yeah, in terms of compiler wishes, I mean, that's kind of a two-way street in a, 
informing the compiler that order of operations does not matter, as well as places where order of operations do matter. I think uh, control both ways is pretty essential. Um, because like you'll have cases where it's important for performance to evaluate things in arbitrary order, maybe change things to a tree like evaluation. But there's also cases where changing the evaluation, it's like the reduction problem where um, if you say paralyze a reduction loop and evaluate things in a different order, you get unpredictable results. So I, I'd like, what one wish I would have as a math library developer is complete control over how relaxed or how precise you can be like to a finer grained uh, level, possibly within a compilation unit or on a per statement basis. So, so I think the math library is very special in this that in the end, I'm looking at less than 100 lines of code that I want to optimize. I spend a lot of time tweaking it. And there, for me, it would work if I can use some very fine grain annotations. But it only works if I use fine grain annotation. If I use that, you know, I cannot compile this with fast math. Then it's completely broken, the entire thing. Just, that's why assembly is probably way too common in some of these libraries. Um, I neither write nor use uh, math library functions, but I got a chance to uh, attend a conference where there were a lot of uh, academics who were generating um, uh, math functions. And uh, I went there with the hope of interesting them in, in glibc. And uh, I was basically summarizing some of the stuff that I saw uh, in the Git log uh, that happened uh, during 227. And I mentioned that some of the functions lost uh, correct rounding um, at the, with the advantage that they're now faster. And most of them seemed a bit horrified by this. Uh, they, were, they were basically saying that uh, lower precision, uh, slightly lower precision with correct rounding is preferable to uh, like this kind of vague promise that most of the things are correctly rounded but some results are, are not. Uh, I just wanted to mention that. And another thing I wanted to say was that there was, there seemed to be some interest from these people. Most of them were like PhD students or professors uh, uh, in university. Uh, there seemed to be some interest from them in contributing to GLBC, but they seemed to be kind of scared by uh, a lot of the, you know, bookkeeping, like error checking and stuff like this. I just wanted to say that there may be some people who can help with this, but need some hand-holding. Yeah. So I guess I said two things. But okay, that's a useful feedback. Um, 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 sorry, I, I would like to add that uh, on, on, on tree level, we have just plus tree code that is common for the integer addition and floating point addition, but maybe we should be able to subdivide that into plus that is, uh, can be reassociated for floating, floating point and plus that should not be reassociated re for float, floating point. Or maybe that should not be a tree code, or a, but rather an internal function. So that is probably something to raise on the mailing list. So at the language level, what you want for saying this particular bit of code can be reassociated seems more or less like the TS18661-5 pragma FM Valau associative law. So it sounds like you want particular pieces from TS18661-5 to allow certain transformations. And then you'd put the relevant statement in a block of its own and put the pragma there. So, Savolch, uh, the benchmark numbers that you mentioned towards the beginning of your uh, presentation, those are, those are GLIPC micro benchmarks, right? Or are they? No, that's my own micro benchmark. I so, bench, but I. When are you going to contribute them upstream? <laughs> so, actually, all of my code available publicly in GitHub that I, I, uh, that I contribute back to GLIPC. Uh, and I have my benchmark code there. Uh, these are, uh, yeah, simple benchmark lo loops. What I was planning to contribute, but I didn't get there, is 
some traces. For example, I said sine f and cosine f depends on what inputs you are actually trying. It, it, it has lots of branches for other argument reduction cases and different algorithms will behave very differently on a particular trace of, of I inputs because of branch predictions. Or what, what I, I totally understand that because the first set of inputs that I put in were based on the old algorithm and that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing that you'd probably do to get like an understanding of what your algorithm is doing, right? Uh, but then the, the concern I have with this is that, uh, and the reason why I'm kind of pressing to get the benchmarks in to GLibc is that, uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that this is not the last iteration of math improvements. There might be something that comes down in the future and we shouldn't reach a situation where everyone's got their own version of a math routine and their own benchmark <laughs> saying that, hey, this is the benchmark that my math routine works well for. Instead, if we have those benchmarks in the bench test, then everything basically gets compared with that uh, benchmark, which is the reason yeah, why I'm, I'm it, kind of pushing it just, for that turns out that the GUPC build system is very hard to deal with. And in particular, bench test, I, I couldn't figure out how to quickly just rebuild the functions that I'm, I'm changing and just bench, benchmarking those functions that I'm rebuilding. And I, re, I had to do very quick uh, iterations on this. I oh, sure. change something, run the micro benchmark, change something, run the micro benchmark. And GLIPC, it's like, I like, make bench, bench test or whatever, and it tries to run all the benchmarks and... Right, you know, so there, there are new targets now, uh, but that's, that's an orth orthogonal thing. Uh, if you need help with getting those benchmarks in, we could probably talk about it and... Yeah, uh, okay. I could get so that in it, as it's, soon as it's possible. a very, it's a build system issue and it's, it right, takes, sure. takes a lot of time I can to help sort that. it out. I can help with that, no issues. That's why I did it outside of GLIPC, most sure. of these. I think on, I think on slide tw 12 you mentioned the, the problem with the GCC optimization, not doing the right thing with the addresses of constants. Uh, sounds like something really nice for the GCC boxilla because if we get that wrong in your code, chances are we also get that wrong on many, many instances of user code. So, like, please. So the, the difficult thing is that it's, it's not clear when you put these constants in this, I don't know what, I, I don't really know the terminology there in the compile internals, but there are some common sections and literal pools and all sort of other mechanisms, and the way it is currently happening on at this AR64, if I use, uh, let's say, polynomial coefficients, then GCC assumes that, they coef that those coefficients might appear elsewhere in your program and, and try to only store them when, once and somehow organize everything al al along these assumptions that you can reuse constants. But that means all the coefficients we have separately all over the place. So they have different addresses. So then the GC computes the address separately. So I have separate address computations for each coefficient and that you get lots of instructions. And I, I want to force GCC not to do that, but you know, load the coefficients next to each other. So ARC4 even has load pair instructions to load a pair of numbers and things like that. And currently the reliable way to do that is move everything in a separate translation unit have a struct with a specific layout, and that's it. And then the compiler cannot mess around. Cannot. But even if I put it in the same translation, it GC just sees that, oh, that's using that constant, and it unpacks things and puts things apart. We'll, we'll take the one last question, then we're out of time, all right? So um, the unfortunate fact is that the your optimizations t will take years until they get to users using the normal distribution upgrade procedure. And I looked into providing a separate libm build so that we can build libm against the public ABI of um, the installed glibc and you, uh, we choose a way out ba ABI baseline for that so that you can run the newer libm on older systems and 
given that work, I wonder if it's reasonable to pick up these old patches, look at them again, and try to uh, get them committed. And the question is if we want to commit to the additional um, long-term maintenance burden for uh, uh, the code that depends on, on the public ABI only and doesn't use internal glibc functions from the MAF library. That's, I think, the major drawback in, in this context. Yeah, I, I don't know what's the best way, but I'm also seeing this problem that the math functions, the glibc is not updated very quickly, and math functions, in principle, should be possible to update more quickly because they don't have too many dependencies on other C runtime internals, except for Erno and iFunk and the, some, some ugly bits. So yes, I, I would be happy if, if there was a more a quicker way to move these two distributions. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk.